If you start with reading Revelation as a speculation of end times, well, then you can try to find everything that feeds into that narrative. As opposed to a healthier approach, which we're trying to do here in our study and would encourage in any study of Revelation, which is that this is a book about Jesus. This is a book about the way of Jesus. And the seven churches, the seven lampstands, the seven uh, spiritual conditions teach us of what keeps us from experiencing the fullness of following of Jesus. It's not so much about speculation as it is about what does it mean to live faithfully in the world. And listen, if you're a pre, post, mid, tribulation, whatever, like that's great. I'm a pan uh, tribulation person. I believe that it will all pan out. All pan out, right? It's Jesus. Jesus is going to have his way, and I trust Jesus, and Jesus will always be faithful to his people, and so to rest in that. That said, there, there are some disturbing stuff. We're going we're gonna to pray about this later on in the service, about what's happening in the Middle East. But hey, friends, can I, just give you, uh, can I just give you an invitation this week to just bow out of the garbage that you're going to see from Christians in America around what's happening in Israel? And the fact is, is those are complex problems with real people, and, uh, and our trips to Israel always uh, expose us to, to the different perspectives that come in that place. It's really complicated, and we pray for, for God to be reconciling and healing that land and helping us to be reconcilers too. Amen? Amen. Okay. So we're on the fourth church of seven churches. We're at the hinge point, right? Seven churches, seven lampstands, seven angels. And today, we're going to enter into the fourth church. We've heard about Ephesus. What did they struggle with? Their first love for Jesus, right? All the way to Smyrna, Pergamum, now Thyatira. That rolls off the tongue, right? Thyatira. We, by the way, don't know how it's pronounced because it doesn't exist anymore. But Thyatira. Uh, Every church up to this point is dealing with a spiritual condition, a spiritual condition. Today's is no different. In some ways, you could argue, and I would argue, it probably is the most relevant to us as Christians today in our context. And it lies in the word that Jesus is going to use here in our text, the word tolerate. Tolerate. Okay. Let's read together. Chapter 2, starting with verse 18. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. We're going to stop right there, okay? Stop right there. If you have your Bible with you, I'm I hope you can bring your Bible with you in this series. The, the phrase or the words that I would underline right here are the words burnished bronze, feet like burnished bronze. Context, again, just as we've seen in previous chapters and previous, uh, previous uh, letters to the churches, is so important. We see here an image of Jesus' eyes like burning fire and feet like burnished bronze. That's kind of strange. Why use that? Well, he is referring back to the first chapter's description of Jesus. Remember, this is, this is a book about Jesus. It's about Jesus holding all of, of creation in his hands and, uh, and what God will do to redeem the world. And in chapter 1, we read about how he has these eyes of fire and feet that are burnished bronze. Well, it's coming up again here in the letter to Thyatira. Thyatira, by the way, out of all the seven churches, is the least well-known. It was the smallest of the cities. It was up in the mountains, inland from the port cities like Ephesus. Thyatira was best known. Uh, you can see the mountains here. Think Lord of the Rings and the dwarves. Thyatira was best known for the smelting of bronze. So they were metal workers. And immediately when they heard this word from Jesus, eyes of fire... Burnished bronze for feet. They would have thought that speaks to us. We know about bronze. That's our expertise. In fact, they're also known, uh, just as an aside, they're known for their purple dye, which uh, there's a reference in Acts chapter 16 to a character that many of us are familiar with, Lydia. Lydia, who was a dealer in fine linen and especially in purple linen, which was used by royalty in that day, day because it was so rare. Okay? That's where that dye came from, was Thyatira. Now, in that day, just as ours, there were guilds for commerce. We don't use the word guild uh, much anymore, 
But uh, actually, there's someone in our church. Uh, Art Peterson is part of an organist's guild. That must be an interesting bunch. I'm going to say no more, okay? But that guild must get together and have a raging party, I'm sure. But we don't use guild language very much. But in that day, just as in ours, there's, there's guilds or groups for commerce that group together. These guilds held considerable power in every city. You see, this is more than just some type of workers' union, although that's essentially what it was. It also had these components that were very, very interesting. Because each guild had a patron god. And you would worship that god in order to bring favor and blessing to your industry. For the bronze workers in Thyatira, the patron god was Apollo. In fact, they, fi- they found on bronze coins from that day, they've unearthed bronze coins, that on one side had the son of God, which was always referenced as not Jesus, not Jesus. Who was the son of God in that day? Caesar, right? The son of God, the, the morning star. Uh, that has fallen from the sky was the first depiction. Colossians, we read about this, was the depiction of Caesar, who was the divine son of God. Well, in this picture, it's different. The, the guild would uh, worship Apollo. They had Apollo on one side of the coin and the, the son of God, Caesar, on the other. And these guilds weren't just about employment. They were also religious in nature, and historians tell us that the guilds would hold ceremonies where the industry would be celebrated, meat would be sacrificed to Apollo, the god, or whatever god was being worshipped, and that meat was then sacrificed to idols, and then they would eat the meat. Okay, So just like in Smyrna, that we read about a couple weeks ago, these powerful trade guilds would, would have made it very hard for any Christian to earn a living without belonging to the guild. No guild equals no job. No job equals no source of income to provide for your family. Can you imagine that struggle? Can you imagine? Most of us have never been put in that position. Where to provide for our families was at odds with our vocation. Well, Christians, if they joined in the guild, membership meant that they had to be involved and attend these guild banquets, which were quasi-religious ceremonies, basically, And we'll return to this in a bit, but no doubt most, if not all, of the Christians in that context faced this challenge of their faith being at odds with what they were asked or required to do as a part of the economic system of that day. Okay, So, just like other letters, we're hearing a repeat of the description of chapter 1. These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. When the first hearers of this in Thyatira heard this, they were, saying, they were thinking to themselves, Jesus is speaking exactly to us. Jesus is speaking to the guilds. That the guilds don't have, hold power, Jesus does. Jesus the one is the one who can melt and form and stand in solidarity of power. And so right from the beginning, he's challenging. Jesus is is challenging the established concept of where power comes from. And that it's not Caesar who is the son of God. It is Jesus himself. In fact, here in Thyatira, for the first time, these are the words of the son of God. For the first time in all the churches that have been listed up to this point, this is the first time Jesus uses that phrase, son of God. He is challenging the power of Caesar himself in this declaration. It's just brilliant. And it's so, so good. Then he commends them. Listen to what's next. He commends them saying, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance. Unlike Ephesus, though, listen to what he says. And that you are now doing more than you did at first. Friends, this means that they're on an upward trend. Their discipleship is growing. They're being more faithful. They loved Jesus. They loved each other. Their deeds, their faith, their service, their fellow believers were being loved. They loved God. They were getting it right. A plus. Thyatira, way to go. So what's the problem? Well, let's read on. Verse 20. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Underline tolerate. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. 
I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. And now this comes the righteous judgment of Jesus against this, this person who's leading people astray. He says, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. (sighs) Dang, Jesus is not messing around. That's how dangerous Jezebel is. Now, we name our children after every biblical name there is, Sarah and Abraham and Luke and Matthew and Mary, but no one names their daughter Jezebel. <laughs> Why is that? A part of it's the description here, but, but really, this is, this, is a, this is a minor footnote for the name Jezebel compared to the Jezebel of the Old Testament. If you're familiar with this, the most notorious evil woman in, in Hebrew history appeared in the book of 1 Kings. He was, she was uh, the wife of King Ahab and enticed her husband to worship Baal, which then led to the worship of Israelites worshiping false gods, which then led to all sorts of sexual practices and awful things. And, of course, there's a long story that led to a very dramatic uh, experience with, uh, with a worship experience on the top of a mountain. That's for another day to talk about. But Jezebel is seen as the source of that corruption and that compromise. And just like it did in the Old Testament, in the, in, here in the New, with this mention in Revelation, it also led to practices of pagan sexual immorality that would make 2023 standards of sex blush. Like, we, I couldn't even talk about it in church. It's that bad. The pagan uh, rituals of s- sexual exploit and immorality were just disgusting. And... And that's what Jezebel was saying. It's okay. It's permissive, right? You have freedom to participate in these guilds. And that, if you participate in the guild, well, that means you joined in eating the meals that, of meat that was sacrificed to a false god and then everything that went along with these raging parties. And what was happening at these parties is what the church in Thyatira was being called out on. So, just, just a footnote. You might hear someone even, like, sometimes preach or teach on this passage and it pulls out the sexual immorality thing, it has to be put back into its context. They pull out the, the uh, meeting, eating meat sacrificed to idols has to be understood in its context. Is this guild phenomenon for Thyatira. And this is the thing. While the context is different for us, we don't have trade guilds that hold religious ceremonies and require you to eat meat that's sacrificed to the Seahawks or... You know, we don't do formal things like that. I don't even think it's, it's a good parallel. But the question that we have to struggle with and what makes Thyatira so challenging is this question. How far should I accept and adapt to contemporary standards and practices of living? Or put in biblical terms, you know, how can I be in the world but not of the world? And Jezebel's answer was pretty simple. Eat, drink, and be merry. Eliminate the, uh, assim- the, the differences. Just assimilate. Just take it on and enjoy yourself. Join on in the fun, she says. Friends, this is at the heart of so much conflict within the church over centuries. Massive tension that has existed in the church. On the one hand... The mission of Jesus is not served if we're just a bunch of old-fashioned traditionalists who retreat into our enclaves and live like the Amish, right? How's that working for him? When's the last time you met somebody who came to faith by the Amish, right? No, it's because they don't even care necessarily, right? I'm not dogging on them, but the, their form of, of a religious practice is not something Christians were ever encouraged. Jesus said you need to go out and be salt and light and, and you know, bless your community. So there, on the one hand, you... You can't do that, but on the other hand, we also can't blend in so much that we lose the flavor and the impact of the way of Jesus and have our our beautiful gospel compromised. So what do we do here? We have to go back to that word tolerate that Jesus uses. Our culture has such a strange affection for this word, yet I have never heard a person say they wanted to be tolerated. Nobody goes to their work and go, I just am hoping this is a place where I could be tolerated. Right? 
And yet tolerance is the, is the buzzword of the last, you know, 10, 15 years, right? Jesus doesn't use it positively here either. He says, they have tolerated that woman Jezebel. Hey, listen, if you were to characterize this church in our contemporary standards, it's, it would be the church that loves everything and everyone with no boundaries. It's all love. It's all welcome. It's all, you know, you be you. You get to do whatever you want. God loves you. God is full of love. God is full of, but there's never like this line of like, yeah, you went too far. Like, nope, nope, that, that violates the, the way of Jesus, right? This word tolerate. And, you know, there's some people who would say like, what, what's with this? What's wrong with tolerance, Jesus? What's wrong with not this being non-judgmental? What's, what's wrong with that, you know? We, shouldn't we be accepting of all perspectives, The problem is, what is being tolerated and to what degree? In the classic book on relativism, uh, entitled, I love this title, it's so good. It was was, uh, written in the late 90s uh, by Francis Beckwith and Gregory Kuchel. But uh, relativism is the title with the subtitle being, Planting Your Feet Firmly on Air. Planting Your Feet Firmly on Air. They show that, what are simple areas of tolerance get extended to very complicated areas of ethics. We see this in our day right now, and I don't want to upset anybody, but we're seeing this. this uh, listen, there's nobody in this room, uh, I don't think, but even within our culture, who really understands the complex notions of, of what we understand as sociology, the building and constructs of secure and safe social structures. But our culture uh, does a lot of ethical, uh, 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 messy work around things like gender, um, things around personal truth or experience. But they, in their book, actually talk about this in, in a form that I think is helpful to understand how we, we need to tolerate some things, but then other things we have to nuance and have very complicated conversations about. They argue, for instance, that the flavor of ice cream where tastes are personal and private and individual is something where we need to tolerate. There's a reason why the ice cream shop, 31 Flavors, isn't named Two Flavors. Because you get to have your own preference. You get to have your own personal you know, desire. Nobody wants just two flavors. Anybody here like butter pecan ice cream? Anybody raise your hand? Yeah, yeah. You sick people. <laughs> Who puts nuts in ice cream? What are you, crazy? Next thing, you'll be putting them in brownies. Or worse yet, you're going to put them in cinnamon rolls. <laughs> Whoever thought that was a good idea, right? Who puts nuts in cinnamon rolls? Come on. <laughs> No, but we don't say that because you like butter pecan ice cream, you're wrong. We don't say that. I wouldn't say that because you get to like what you like, right? You shouldn't be faulted for having a different subjective taste about a dessert than someone else. But here's the rub. What if we aren't talking about ice cream flavors, but instead we're talking about numbers, If I say that 2 plus 2 equals 5, then I'm making a different sort of claim. And that doesn't work if you walk into your bank and say 2 plus 2 equals 5 or 6 or 7, whatever, right? They'll go, "Mm mm-mm, sorry. Or how about if the bank told you, hey, I know you deposited $1,000, but our math shows it's only 500. Because that's the way we see the truth. You need to tolerate our perspective, right? That's the difficulty of of you cannot change the truth of an equation that can't be tolerated. It isn't narrow-minded, it's fact. You know how I know it's fact? Because when your cell phone or your computer decides to mess with numbers, nothing works. The system of our universe is built on a, a coded mathematical system that God designed. You can't argue with that fact. Ask any coder of any program of any digital software that's ever existed. You can't tolerate things that empirically cannot work. Okay? The point here is that there are some instances where truth, that is what co- corresponds to reality, is exclusively simple because it is true. 
And the problem of an overly tolerant culture, or worse is what we're hearing from Thyatira, is a church that becomes overly tolerant is it's starting to define reality by things that are not true. Which is what Jezebel was introducing to this community. Tolerance is one thing, but truth is another. Now, if tolerance means being respectful of the beliefs of others and not dehumanizing them, well, then Christianity is in full agreement. And Christians are called, we are called to defend our beliefs in the spirit of 1 Peter. Uh, But to confuse tolerance with truth is just not helpful. And that's what Jezebel was doing. That's what's happening in so many faith communities these days. And we live in such an interesting time with what we tolerate. And notice how our culture will change its mind on things. And it it flips the tables all the time. At any given moment, the culture, there's things that we tolerate and things that we don't, and then it'll flip. 50 or 60 years ago, we used to be very laissez-faire about food and what we put into food. And then we had really strict morals around sex. Now we've reversed the two, and now we're laissez-faire about sex, and we have so many rules about food. Right? All the labels you have to read on the back of a can. Does, is, it, is it non-GMO? Is it gluten-free? Did the chicken get read poetry before it was sacrificed? <laughs> right? All the things you have to know before you eat something. It's hardly an exaggeration. Right? In some mom's groups, you might receive more nasty looks for feeding your children lucky charms for breakfast than if you were to share that you're leaving your husband. In some men's groups, You might get more nasty looks about starting the wrong player on your fantasy football team than if you said you were going to leave your wife. That's crazy. Not to mention, I grew up, just as an aside, I grew up on Frosted Flakes and Captain Crunch. Sometimes Captain Crunch with berries. Sometimes just berries. (laughs) That lovely, beautiful cereal, right? When I was a kid, I'd go to friends' houses and stay the night and we'd get up the next morning, and they'd have, they'd have granola. I'd say, don't your parents love you? <laughs> Point is, I grew up on that stuff. I turned out okay. The physical specimen that you see before you. <laughs> now, the point is, our culture has a very strange sense of what is tolerated. Thyatira teaches us we can't tolerate behavior any behavior that destroys God's image in us, if it's false worship, if it's degradation of our bodies, that's what he's calling out, what Jesus is calling out for us. And it's certainly, that would include things like murder, abuse, rape, any sexual degradation of ourselves or others. So, what does it mean to be faithful to Jesus amid the culture we find ourselves Thyatira is commended for their love, but they lacked one thing. Do you know what it was? Discernment. Discernment. That's why this is a tricky and difficult church to learn from because it's asking us to practice spiritual discernment. They tolerated behavior that was contrary to the way of Jesus and they couldn't recognize it. Now, let's continue and see what Jesus has to say to this. Verse 24. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Isn't that a, a word of freedom? Except to hold on to what you have until I come. That's his word to the faithful amongst that community. But then verse 26, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one, notice the language, the switch from Caesar is the morning star. He'll say, I will give that one the morning star. This is a reference to later on in in Revelation. We're going to see Jesus as the image of the morning star who brings light to a dark world. And he concludes with, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There's too much in this ending to, to be able to capture it all in the last few minutes that we have. But I just want to say this. We 
can be encouraged to hold on to what we have, to resist Satan's so-called deep secrets. But there's no way that I could just come up with a quick list of all the ways that in this room alone, we are capable of compromising the gospel for Jesus' sake and for our own sake. The question that the Holy Spirit has to ask and you have to have ears to hear is simply this. Has tolerance caused spiritual compromise in your life? Have you tolerated Jezebel in your life? If you're not if you're not willing, but I hope you are, if you're really honest with yourself, have you begun to tolerate sins in your life? The Holy Spirit is speaking. God, Jesus is speaking, if you have ears to hear. The fact is, is you know. You know the areas within your little digital devices or computers where you've allowed sexual immorality to come into your life. You know the things that have come out of your mouth when you're around certain people that are loose with their words and will, will cut people down without thinking twice. That passes as social, you know, uh, uh, regular social life in our culture. Gossip is one of the worst ways of Jezebel to tear people down. Have you, have you done something with your finances that is no longer honoring God? Now, I think if there's one that covers so many multitude of things in our culture, which you uh, have done something impressive this morning, and that is that so many Christians in our day have compromised to irregular worship uh, attendance or experiences. And you get, you get an award today because <laughs> you showed up. And you said worship was important for me this morning, important for my family. But in so many aspects of our culture, it's just easier to compromise and stay home and grab Starbucks and read the New York Times. The fact is, it's not if you worship, it's what you worship. You don't get to decide if you worship. Human beings are worshipers. We worship. It's where do we direct our worship? Jezebel was just telling people, you can direct your worship towards, towards these guild festivals, these parties. But worship is one of the areas that we must not compromise in. And I applaud you for making that a priority. We live in a difficult day where the tidal wave of messaging around you be you, do what's most pleasurable to you, feed the hedonistic desires of your heart and no one will judge you, is the rampant message. And so the idea of following Jesus but never having to sacrifice anything is is the compromised message of Jezebel. If you follow Jesus, you must lay your life down. You must lay parts of your life down. You must let the Holy Spirit examine your heart and see where is it that you've compromised on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where are you letting in things that are, that are false worship? Where are you letting in things that keep you from growing closer to Jesus? That's the word Jesus has for Thyatira. I can't tell you what you're what your area of compromise is, only the Holy Spirit can tell you that. But I'll say this, and I love Jesus' words here at the end. It's this, that Jesus knows the intense pressure that you're facing. We live in a day and age, friends, like no other. Even back in Thyatira's age, they did not have 10,000 messages a week being pumped into their brain through advertising and social media and, you know, everything that comes into our, our world uh, today as a believer. Jesus knows the intense pressure you're facing. He knows how difficult it can be. And he's asking you, he's encouraging you to hold fast. And if you have ears to hear, then let the Holy Spirit speak. I want to, we're going to sing a song now called Resurrender, which uh, we've sung it before, but it's such a beautiful song and uh, is appropriate for for today's message, but at the end of the service, I'm, gonna, I'm actually just going to let us, at the end of the service, just to sit with that question of what is it that you've allowed into your heart that has led to some compromise, and how can you get back to a, a pure, more, more holy 
uh, relationship with Jesus and with each other. And so we're going to do that in just a few minutes. But I want to pray, and then, and then we'll uh, sing, and we'll close with that prayer exercise, okay? Jesus, thank you that, uh, that you, you speak these words of truth and that you uh, embolden us, that cur- your courage is contagious for us. Would you help us to see accurately, to discern well the ways that the Jezebel spiritual condition has come into our hearts and our lives, maybe even into our homes, into our social circles? Would you bring us back to our first love and the desire to have unblemished hearts that seek after you and you alone? Help us to re-surrender our hearts to you again this morning and to trust you, to let you see through to our hearts and the things that we have allowed to capture our heart's imagination and worship. Help us to resist Satan's so-called deep secrets of lust and power and money and pleasure. And give us courage to be victorious to the end. And in that place, we will stand with you, victorious over all the nations. And we pray this in your name, and now we sing your song. And all God's people said, amen.